Howdy folks, and welcome back once again to Cold Waters with Commander Jingles McJingleberry, our fearless commanding officer of the USS Jacksonville, a Los Angeles-class attack submarine. The war's actually going quite well, despite my numerous attempts to bollocks it all up. But the Reds are having one last stab at conquering Iceland so that they can interdict those transatlantic convoys and prevent the resupply of war material to Europe from the USA and I've been sent to stop them. We have a new sonar contact bearing 30 degrees designated Sierra 1. Now we're doing a fair old speed, 26 knots, but we are at a depth of 600 feet. Unfortunately there's no thermal layer and no surface duct, so the first thing that we do is we rig this boat for ultra quiet and come down in speed to 5 knots. Then we can get that towed array out and start... oh, there we go. One contact already, Sierra 1. In case it wasn't obvious, by the way, just like in my last Cold Waters video, something went seriously wrong while recording this gameplay and I just couldn't capture any sound. So enjoy the ambient background music. And the sonar contacts are popping up all across the board. This is good. That's a lot of enemy ships. And another one, Sierra 4. And another one, Sierra 5. How many ships have they sent? And how many are transports and assault ships? And how many are escorts? And there's Sierra 6. Consonar torpedo in the water. Oh, bollocks, and it's right on top of me. There it is. It's an air launched. There's a helicopter out there. I swear, helicopters are the bane of my existence. Right, no point in being subtle. All ahead flank torpedo evasion. Drop a noisemaker. At this speed and this depth I am cavitating, but I shouldn't cavitate for long because I'm going to go deep and get underneath the search pattern of that weapon. And it does not have a lock. I'm no longer cavitating, so I'm no longer being as noisy, and there's a reasonable chance they've lost me. That weapon has certainly lost me. It's far too shallow to be able to reacquire. So what's that helo going to do? Because they can't carry a lot of tall helos. Oh, is he going to waste another one on a deeper search pattern? Well, I say waste. It's not necessarily a waste. I mean, that's how you attack a submarine. It's relentless. You keep banging away at it. And even if you don't sink them, you can force them to abandon their mission because you just make things too hot for them. Still just the one torpedo in the water, however. But, of course, the escorts are now fully aware that there's a hostile submarine in the area, so they're going to be vectoring to intercept. Everybody's sonar's gone active. This mission just got a lot more difficult. So right now I want to put some distance between myself and where that helo thinks I am, because he's going to be very, very vigorously and aggressively prosecuting that contact. So, a couple of minutes later, no fresh weapons have been fired at me, and I'm starting to regain contact on this surface flotilla. I've managed to ID one of them, Sierra 1's a Krivak. Sierra 3 looks like a cannon. There are seven contacts out here now, by the way, that I know of. And that's when I notice, long before my sonar room does, there's a torpedo on top of me. And I'm furiously panning around, trying to actually locate this thing. The weapon behind me self-destructs. And now the sonar team are reporting... Con sonar torpedo in the water. Yes, I know. <laughs> I saw it appear on the tactical map. There it is. And again, it's right on top of me. And this time it knows my depth. So, drop a noisemaker. All head flank torpedo evasion. There's a knuckle formed. It's got me, however. It's coming around. Wait, no. Fooled by the knuckle. But only momentarily. So once again, it's time to boogie on down in the red alert shuffle and uh, try to get out of the search pattern of this weapon. Now it lost contact, so it started circling, and that's given me the opportunity. While it's circling around, get some distance. Barreling along here at flank speed, and by the time the weapon comes around, I think we've done it. Yes. Okay, that one has also missed. I think it's around about time 
we started giving these guys something to worry about, because this has been very, very one-sided up until now. I currently hold a pretty good contact on that cannon. That's the one guy that I haven't actually lost contact with. Of course, I'm going to need to slow down in order to fire a weapon. I need to be travelling at speeds of less than 20 knots, otherwise it's just going to jam and wreck the torpedo tube. But I'm pretty confident that that weapon behind me is not going to reacquire, so... Let's slow our ass down and get a weapon in the water against Contact Sierra 3 designated Cannon Class Destroyer. Weapon away. I should have fired that from the tubes on the other side. It's gone across the bows. I might lose the wire. Wait, what? Con, sonar, torpedo in the water? Okay, drop a noisemaker. Bearing 221. Are they sure that's not the weapon behind me? Did I lose it when it was in the baffles and they just reacquired? Or is there another one? If there is, I'm not seeing it. Although, looking at the tactical map, but that could be my weapon. That one behind me is never going to reacquire. There goes my weapon, heading up to the surfers. Is there another? Oh shit, yes there is. <laughs> okay, right, all ahead flank. Let's get the hell out of here. It doesn't actually have me yet. Let's make sure it never does. I think it's going after the noisemaker. And we're just going to take some really big steps over in a different direction. Now, it's difficult to tell. Did that thing just turn and head towards me, or did it turn and head away? That one just self-destructed, ran out of fuel. No, I think we're good. They're on a bit of a fishing expedition up there, aren't they? Still, these weapon drops are a bit too close for comfort. They've got a reasonably good idea of where I am. Of course, I've now given that cannon something else to worry about. And he has now turned and headed off away from my incoming weapon. So that might give me a bit of breathing space. But it's these bloody helicopters that are the problem. And it's always the same when you're in a submarine. It's, it's rarely the surface ships that give you trouble. It's usually enemy submarines, or if there are no enemy submarines around, it's the helicopters. Because the helicopters are a darn sight faster than you are. They've got the dipping sonar, so you can't even hide below the thermal layer. Depending on how deep the thermal layer is, the helo can just lower that dipping sonar right clean through the other side of the layer and maintain contact on you. Once they've got you, it's very difficult to shake prosecution by a determined helicopter pilot, or pilots. I mean, I've got seven sonar contacts out here. Some of them are going to be transport ships, and they're not going to have helicopters, but some of them are going to be escorts, and they clearly do have helicopters. So I've got to get the hell away from this very, very aggressive and determined helicopter pilot. Well, a couple of minutes later, I think I've managed to shake that helo, and I still have that weapon chasing the cannon off. And I'm looking at contact Sierra 5, the cash-in, when suddenly my targeting solution gets a damn sight better very, very quickly. He's a lot closer than I thought he was. He's clearly barreling in here to prosecute the contact that the helo holds. So we're going to want to dissuade him of that notion pronto. And I fire a weapon aft in the direction of that cash-in. Now I set that weapon to go active and start hunting for its target at a range of 5,300 yards, because he was that close. But he's coming in at a speed of 32 knots, and it's possible that he might actually overrun and pass over the weapon activation point, in which case it's not going to find him, but I've still got the wire. So just in case, I can always manually take control of that weapon via the command wire. I'm busy ID and other targets at the moment, however. I've managed to ID at least one of the landing ship tanks, the assault ships. So that's a high value target. But I'm going to start taking control of this weapon. For a start, we're going to bring it up to the surface. It's unlikely to find any enemy destroyers at a depth of 600 feet. Well, it might, but later on after we've sunk a few. <laughs> For now, we're off on a fishing expedition of our own. Just turn it around slightly. Still a fairly good contact on that caching. 
and the cannon is still heading at full speed away from the first weapon that we fired. So that may or may not catch up with him. But a Mark 48 has a lot of fuel. It doesn't have as much fuel as a spearfish. A spearfish can keep chasing you for an hour. <laughs> right? <laughs> but the Mark 48's no laughing matter either. So it might catch him. Either way, he's running away and he's not attacking me. So it's all good. One less thing for me to worry about. And there's the contact up ahead. And it's at this point, more or less, where this Mark 48 suddenly gets ideas into its head. There it goes. It's just suddenly veered off to port. And it's locked on to something. Now I don't know what that is. It might be Contact Sierra 1, the Krivak, because I don't actually currently hold him as a contact. And he may now be in that location, but... Well, I'd rather manually guide the weapon into a contact that I know is there, the cash-in, rather than have it go on its own fishing expedition for something that it just happened to pick up by itself. Keeping a quick eye on the cannon, and he's still furiously heading away from my first weapon. There's the cash-in. Sierra 5, he is no longer heading in my direction. Big surprise. <laughs> he is now turning around and making best speed the hell away from this torpedo. Yes, Mr. Cashin, you went looking for a submarine. Congratulations, you found one. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Yeah, not so good. He's doomed. There's no way he's going to survive this. You might think that it's a bit unfair and one-sided. Um, and you'd be right. Submarine versus surface ship is a very unfair and one-sided fight. But that's the whole point of submarine warfare. They didn't design and build submarines because they wanted to give surface ships a fair fight. Now you might be sitting there thinking about World War II when the U-boats definitely had it all their own way at first, but then anti-submarine warfare technology and tactics started being developed by the Allies and suddenly the U-boats were having a very, very hard time from about 1942-1943 onwards. But the thing is, U-boats weren't submarines. No, really they weren't. They were submersibles. There's a big difference. A modern submarine can submerge and stay submerged for months if it has to. And it can attack while submerged. A U-boat could only attack either on the surface or from periscope depth, and they spent most of their time on the surface and attacked mostly at night and on the surface. They could only submerge for a couple of hours, and they were very, very slow while they were submerged. If you could force a U-boat to submerge, and he's tried to ditch another noisemaker to shake me off, but nope, not fallen for that one. Not with manual control. Got him. But yeah, World War II. If you could force a U-boat to submerge, you'd basically beaten him. Oh, hang on a second. A very, very good contact on that Krivak. So we're going to give him the good news as well. He's heading in our direction. We're going to see about that. Weapon away. Off you go. Anyway, yeah. Anti-submarine warfare. World War II. The, the British, and when I say the British, I mean the British and the Royal Canadian Navy had a very different philosophy to that of the US Navy when it came to submarine warfare in the Atlantic. For the British and Commonwealth navies, it was all about defending the convoy, ensuring that nobody in the convoy got sunk. For the Americans, it was all about sinking U-boats. Now you might think, well isn't that the same thing? If you can sink the U-boats that are attacking the convoy, nobody in the convoy is going to be sunk. Well, oh there's that bloody helo. Well, he's nowhere near me, so that's a good thing. Okay. Anyway, yes. The subtle but important distinction between US and British and Commonwealth anti-submarine warfare philosophy. For the British and Commonwealth navies, it was all about making sure nobody in the convoy got sunk, making sure the convoy got through. For the Americans, it was all about sinking U-boats. Now, if you can find attack and sink all of the U-boats attacking your convoy, then yes, obviously your convoy is going to be safe. But that's a very big if. Now when the US Navy took over responsibility for convoy protection in the Western Atlantic, until they handed over to the Royal Canadian Navy, which I think took place around about Newfoundland, and then the Royal Canadian Navy would hand over to the Royal Navy in the Eastern Atlantic, 
at that time, anti-submarine warfare technology and tactics weren't quite mature enough to ensure that you were probably going to sink any U-boat that you went after. So an American destroyer, if it detected a U-boat, would continue attacking that U-boat until either the U-boat was sunk or they lost it. He'd managed to slip away. And that's not a bad thing. But the British and Canadians, while they would also very vigorously and aggressively attack any U-boats that they detected, they wouldn't do it at the expense of leaving gaps in the defensive screen around the convoy. Driving that U-boat down below attack depth, getting him off the surface, forcing him to submerge, if that was all you'd achieved, that was good enough, because he wasn't going to be able to attack the convoy. And you could resume your position in the defensive screen around that convoy and ensure that nobody else slipped through any gap that you might have left while you were prosecuting that one U-boat. As a result, the British and Canadians lost less ships than the Americans did, even if the Americans managed to sink more U-boats. So while it certainly probably didn't seem obvious at first, there is a very important distinction between having your priority protecting convoys and having your priority sinking U-boats. They look like they're the same thing at first, but they're not. Anyway, congratulations are in order for the captain of this Krivak. He came looking for a submarine. He found one. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how he feels about that. And once again, we've got the command wire. I mean, we're going to sink him anyway, but having the command wire just means that we don't have to worry about any noisemakers, which is only going to delay the inevitable. If we didn't have the wire, the weapon might be fooled by any noisemakers that he drops, but he's just not fast or manoeuvrable enough to put enough distance between himself and this weapon when it sweeps around and reacquires. He can't vary his depth in the way that a submarine can. But don't worry, we're going to vary his depth for him. There it goes. Just a matter of time. Let's see if he tries to ditch a noisemaker. Another good reason for keeping control of the weapon via the command wire is because we're actually quite close to the wreck of that cash-in. And if I didn't have the command wire, this weapon could lock onto the wreck of the cash-in instead. I have actually seen that happen before. Oh, hello. There we go, he's dropped a noisemaker. What's it going after? Well, it doesn't matter what it's going after, because I've got control of the weapon, so we're just going to manually swing it back around a port, and that wasn't a bad manoeuvre from the captain of that uh, destroyer. He decoyed the weapon away to starboard, and then pulled a hard turn to port. You know, there's a slim chance that that might have actually worked, because when the weapon got decoyed away to starboard, that put the wreck of the cash-in right inside its search cone. So, well done. And there's another noisemaker. Not, not that it matters, but well done for, you know, it was a good effort. But I do have the command wire, so I'm not going to fall for that one. We got him. Two escorts down, five ships to go. How many more escorts do they have? How big is this convoy? I've got seven contacts. Well, I don't have seven contacts at the moment, but I did have seven contacts. How many of them are escorts, and how many of them are landing and assault ships? If I could deal with the escorts, I could just take the transport and assault ships out with missiles. Let's have a look. Seven contacts. I've sunk two and they're both escorts. There's a third escort out there that I know of. That cannon is still afloat. He's managed to outrun that Mark 48. It must have self-destructed by now. I've got three ID'd as transport and assault ships and I have no idea what Sierra 4 is. It could be another transport and assault ship. It could be another escort. The cannon is way too far away to be an immediate threat. Sierra 4? I have no idea not only what Sierra 4 is, I have no idea where Sierra 4 is. I need to be careful about that helo, but I'm going to come up to periscope depth and I'm going to raise my ESM mast and try to get a better fix on the location particularly of Sierra 4. I'd really like to know what that is because if it's an escort, it could give me problems. Looks like the cannon's coming back in this direction as well. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to have to be quick. And I can't afford to keep the ESM mast up for too long because they will be searching with their surface search radar precisely for periscopes and submarine masts. So I can only really afford a quick sweep. But I figure it's worth the risk. Right, ESM mast up. 
contacts are all being upgraded to master contacts. Still nothing on Sierra 4. Okay, let's get the mast down, rig for dive, and let's get a shot off against this cannon. He's coming back looking for trouble. Sierra 4 might be a submarine. I would have expected to have found something with the ESM mast. Oh, hang on. Sierra 4 just updated. It's now plotting his position as all the way over there. Well, I don't believe that for a second because it's a terrible quality contact. But while I can't see the ship because the quality of the contact is too bad, the one thing I know for sure is that no transport or landing ship is going to be moving through the water at that speed. And his acoustic signature tallies up pretty well with that of a Udaloy class guided missile destroyer. So I know from his speed that he's an escort, and from his acoustic profile, I'm pretty sure I know exactly what kind of escort, and that is very bad news. Udaloys are very, very dangerous ships. But, well, Los Angeles class attack boats are very, very dangerous submarines as well. And my money's on the submarine. Right, first weapon in the water, going after that cannon, Contact Master 3. You know what's happening here, don't you? I mean, look at the situation, that Udaloy is miles away, he's right on the other side of the convoy. And the cannon is coming back for another attempt at sinking the Los Angeles class Hunter Killer attack boat. Why is the Udaloy not getting involved in the attack? Simple answer to that one. He's the guy in charge. <laughs> He's sitting safely back on the other side of the convoy, directing his minions in the cashins and the cannons to come over and get sunk by the American submarine. What? Well, it's what I would do. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> All joking aside, though, it does make a certain amount of sense. Um, I mean, the Udalo is the big ship. It's got the command and control equipment and staff on board, it's almost certainly the surface action group commander and his job is to direct the attack on any contacts of interest. But he's running out of boats to do it with. <laughs> I mean, you know, if the cannon does pick me up as a contact, then the Udalo can launch missiles at me from where he is, so it does make sense. We're just going to have to sink the cannon and make sure he doesn't pick me up as a contact. Jingles, you mentioned earlier the difference between convoy protection philosophies between the British and Commonwealth navies and the US Navy in World War II, at least at first. These guys all seem to be abandoning their positions in the defensive screen to come after you. What's the deal here? Well, this isn't World War II anymore. Um, we know that the Soviets tended to send the submarines out in wolf packs, and the Soviets knew just as well that the Western navies tend to send their submarines out as lone wolves. So if you've picked up one Los Angeles class, you can be reasonably sure... Ouch, that looked like it was painful. Uh, you can be reasonably sure that that Los Angeles class is alone. So sending everything that you have after him is perfectly sensible and absolutely the right thing to do. Anyway, we're at periscope depth and I have harpoons loaded. And that Udaloy now has no choice but to close in and try to finish me off himself. And he does appear to be heading this way. So, yeah, as expected. We're going to send him a harpoon. Now, there's a reasonable chance he's actually going to be able to shoot that harpoon down. The Udaloy does have a fairly comprehensive array of close-in weapon systems. But while he's dealing with that, we're going to get some weapons away against some of these transport ships as well. Now, there's a reasonable chance, even if the Udaloy didn't detect the harpoon launch, the Hilo, although it is dark, might have seen the launch. And again, harpoons aren't entirely subtle. Uh, they do, certainly when the booster is firing, generate a lot... Oh, bugger. I've screwed up. Went too fast. I cavitated. Only for a second. But that can be all it takes. So I'm going to want to get this thing deep. Because I guarantee you that if the Udaloy heard that, he's launched a missile with a torpedo strapped to the end of it. And it is heading in my direction. 
Well, I managed to get down to 900 feet in depth without getting into any trouble before I detect a torpedo in the water. And there it is. It's coming down to my depth. But I am 900 feet down, and it's going to take time for that thing to get down to my depth and start searching and acquiring me as a target. So I'm going to use that time to get the hell out of here. Here it comes. I'm already heading in the other direction. It's still a couple of hundred feet above me. And it's gone into a search pattern. But it's never going to find me over there. So I didn't have a lot of time to get out of the way of that weapon, but I had enough because I was at 900 feet. So while that thing is fruitlessly searching for me, and there's probably a helo 900 feet above it, listening out with its dipping sonar, we're going to just casually be somewhere else and then see what we can do about reacquiring contact. I think there's three of them left, including that Udaloy. I need to take the Udaloy out first, and I don't really want to waste another harpoon on him, because there's a good chance he's just going to shoot it down. So we're going to get back up to periscope depth, have to put some distance between myself and that torpedo, and speed things up a little. And once we're far enough away, we'll come back up to periscope depth, we'll pop the ESM mast up again, get a good fix on all of the remaining contacts, and then we're going to sink them. At periscope depth, ESM mast up, and come on, bingo. We've reacquired contact with Sierra 2, the Rapucha, and Sierra 6, the Anguemua, and we've upgraded the contact on Sierra 4, the Udaloy. That's now Master 4. All right. Well, he's going to be looking for our mast with his surface search radar, so let's not leave it up for too long and make it easy for him. ESM mast stowed and secured for dive. And we're going to take the Udaloy out with a torpedo. You can shoot down a harpoon. You can't shoot down a Mark 48. Weapon away. Once again, we've kept the command wire, and it turns out it only takes one Mark 48 to sink a Udaloy. And that just leaves the two remaining transports, and we've picked up no further contacts during the whole course of this engagement, so I'm pretty sure that those two remaining transports are the only two ships left, and we have plenty of harpoons loaded, and unlike the Udaloy, these guys don't have close-in weapon systems to defend themselves from missile attacks. Or at least, that's what I thought. I mean, they're transport ships, why would they have close-in weapon systems? And this harpoon, heading for the Anguemwa, is going to kill it, because the Amguemwa does not have close-in weapon systems, but it turns out that the Rapucha actually does. I don't know if you can just see the silhouette of the Rapucha off on the horizon over there, but pay attention to that. That thing is actually armed with two 30mm 6 barrel Gatling close-in weapon systems, and is entirely capable, there it is, of shooting down an incoming missile. The Amguemwa's stuffed, of course. <laughs> but, oh, no... That's not good. The helo's closing. Well, I don't know if he's closing in. I can't actually... He's not He's not displayed on the tactical map, but he's heading somewhere in a hurry. I wonder what it could be. Crap. I'd better get out of here. Well, that was a bit of a blow to morale. That's two very expensive harpoons I've wasted now. One on the Udaloy and one on the Rapucha. I mean, I can sink the Rapucha or just close in and finish him off with a torpedo. But I've got to get over there first, and then get close enough that I'm not sitting here for the next half hour watching a torpedo catch up with him, and I'm under helicopter attack. Well, I'm assuming I'm under helicopter attack. And yes, I know I'm cavitating, but I don't care. I need to get deep. And I need to get deep quick, because there's going to be a torpedo on my head any second now. And I'm not too worried about being noisy and cavitating while I get down to a safe depth, because while the helo's in transit... He doesn't have his dipping sonar in the water, so he's not actually listening out for me while he vectors to my reported position. And there's nothing else afloat that's able to... Well, actually, is there? Because I, I didn't know an awful lot about the Rapucha. I just thought, well, it's a transport ship. It's not going to have weapons or sensors. Uh, well, it has weapons. It actually has a lot of weapons, not just the 30mm Gatling guns. It's got two twin 57mm guns. It's got a 76mm gun. It's got rocket launchers. It's actually a very, very well-armed ship. They're Polish ships, actually. They're built in the uh, Gdansk naval shipyards for the 
Soviet Navy. It could carry 10 main battle tanks and 340 marines. Now, it's well armed, it carries a lot of troops and tanks, but did it also have sensors that were sophisticated enough to be able to hear me when I was cavitating? I don't know, and I'm not interested in finding out. I'm taking no chances. We're nice and deep. We're a lot faster than he is, so we're going to catch up to him eventually. But I have to confess, impatience did get the better of me here. I could guarantee a kill with a torpedo and it would be completely safe. But again, I would have to sit around waiting for the torpedo to catch up to him once I got close enough to take a practical torpedo shot. And I thought, well, nobody's got time for that. So I came back up to periscope depth once I was sure I'd shaken the helo and got ready to take another harpoon shot. Weapon away. Hopefully, this time, he won't shoot it down because I really don't want to have to spend the rest of the day chasing after him again to get close enough to guarantee a torpedo kill. And at this kind of range, it's not going to take long for me to find out whether or not I do need to continue the chase. That harpoon will be on him within seconds. Good solid contact. It could be better. Let's pop the radar mast up. There's nothing else up here after all. There he is. Yep, we got him. All right, job done. Or so I thought, because it was at almost this exact moment when I didn't see anything, and you can't hear it because this video was recorded without sound for some reason, but I heard a helicopter. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> no, no, bugger off, you in the helicopter. I what? Go away! No, leave me alone! Ah, oh, crap, there he is. <laughs> Look, you're wasting your time. I've sunk all of your ships. Go away! He's not going to go away, is he? No, he's not. <laughs> he wants revenge. There's one torpedo. Um, oh, dear. <laughs> jingles, jingles, jingles. What have you done? That would be a very embarrassing way to end this mission, Jingles. Seriously, you just sunk seven ships. That's a new career best for you in cold waters. Are you really going to end up losing another submarine in the process? Well, I think we've managed to get deep enough to avoid that one. Does he have any more? Wait, no, it's coming down. Is it coming down? It looks like it's coming down. Or is it just circling? You know, it's really hard to tell. I think it's just circling. Oh, buggeration, he's fired another one. <laughs> um, and that one is definitely coming down. Okay, so we've shaken the first one. It's going into a search pattern a couple of hundred feet above my depth. But that second one, again, is it coming down or is it just circling? No, it's coming down. Okay. It's a fair old distance away, though. Okay, yeah, he, he knows he knows I've gone deep. And he has dropped the second weapon at a greater depth. But it took time to get down here, and by the time it's gone into a search pattern, I've cleared the area. How many torpedoes does he have? Does he have two? Or does he have four? You know, I'm not even entirely sure what type of helicopter it was. It was a Kamov of some description. What was it? A Was it a KA-50? Well, it wasn't a KA-50. I don't know what one of those looks like. But was it a KA-28? A K I, I haven't got a clue. I couldn't tell you. I don't know enough about Soviet naval helicopters. Let's just accelerate time and get out of here. No further weapons in the water. They're never going to catch me. One's run out of fuel. Second one's run out of fuel. Can I exit the mission? Nope, aircraft nearby. All right. Accelerate time a little more. <sighs> so, what did you get up to today? <laughs> hey, we've made it. Seven ships sunk. That's my record. I've seen people, Jive Turkey for example, sink nine ships in one mission but seven is the most I've ever come across the Admiral has got to be happy with that one Admiral sir I sank that Soviet fleet you sent me oh there it is <laughs> yes 
if there's one thing that puts a smile on the old man's face it oh hang on a second what's this oh the legion of merit for me sir really you're too kind what's that sir exceptional and consistently outstanding service you don't have very high standards do you admiral sir <laughs> You're very easily pleased, is what I'm saying. But, you know, hey, I'll take it. It'll go very nicely with all of the other medals that you've showered on me so far during this war patrol. What's this? Reds out of Iceland? Iceland? You're welcome. It was nothing, really. Well, the end of this war is very definitely in sight. However, despite the fact that the Reds have been forced to the negotiating table, as long as they still have their ballistic missile boats, they have a very, very strong bargaining counter to use at that negotiating table. And so our next mission is to venture into the lion's den, the bastion, underneath the arctic ice caps, and go hunting bombers. All of that in the next episode of Cold Waters with Commander Jingles McJingleberry. Until then, take care, and I'll catch you next time.